All right, welcome back to Slideshow for Victory Garden. This is the seventh slideshow, and we're going to be beginning the year 2012 with January 10th. Um, and we've seen a lot of the same sort of views in these upcoming slideshows, so they're going to be a little bit quicker, I think. Uh, but I may pause every once in a while and talk about something that's going on. Um, in this first picture, this is just uh, some clover and chickweed that I was growing in a container inside over the winter. I just wanted to see what would sprout through some of our uh, unfinished compost. And uh, chickweed and crimson clover came up pretty quickly. Uh, next picture, this is out in the old Four Sisters Guild, uh, which is now covered in vetch. That's the main green that you see there is common vetch. Uh, as well as some Osaka purple mustard, their daikon radishes, arugula, spinach, and uh, some cabbage as well. And there's also garlic growing in this bed, and probably a whole handful of other species that we didn't plant that are growing. Zoomed out a little bit from there, you can see just how green this is. This is January 10th, um, so we're having a really mild winter at this point, and which, you know, and if you're doing permaculture, uh, you're paying attention to the temperatures. Uh, so, you know, trying to push the envelope instead of just saying, well, it's winter, I can't grow anything. Look at how green this is in the middle of January. Um, birch tree, you know, everything is uh, pretty much bedded down for the winter. You can see I've got a whole bunch of branches tucked in around that birch tree that's in the center right and there's some garlic that we had planted in 2010 that we still allowed to just keep growing and we want to see how it divides and grows with just a, a winter, a fall through early spring uh, growth period. Um, nothing else too interesting in this picture. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, some close-up of that Osaka purple mustard. You can see there's chickweed tucked in growing around as well. Um, there's arugula and there's daikon radish in here. So we're sowing a mixture of our fall and winter crops all together so that we can continue to support the soil life. That's the main purpose of these crops. Uh, we planted a little bit later than we should have. Uh, I think I mentioned that in the last slideshow that we didn't get them planted quite early enough for them to grow as large as they would if we really wanted to harvest a whole bunch from them. Uh, so the main purpose of this was to have a polyculture growing throughout the winter that was replenishing nitrogen as well as feeding the soil food web uh, with as many different types of exudates as possible. You know, every single plant is going to have a different sort of profile on how it handles uh, the soil life. So having a mixture of those over the winter is a nice way to continue on uh, with the idea of having a multiple types of investments into your system. Uh, if you look into the top part of this picture here, the bank up there, that area is going to be turned into uh, a sheet mulched bed in the spring. Uh, we were interested in turning that section in because it's a south facing slope. Uh, we'll get to that later, but uh, you can see just the, the healthy, the amount of healthy growth that we have is pretty good. I finally managed to start getting these uh, mounds built up properly and you'll see those in the upcoming pictures uh, maybe the next slideshow we'll see how far we can get but I planted some kale on the south facing slope of one of these and we have sorrel and chickweed and everything else growing uh, we had so many leaves from these pear trees that I was able to even bed down some of these pines that are going to receive the most sunlight uh, here's some comfrey it's it grows pretty well through the winter. Um, eventually, it did pretty much die off and go into hibernation, but it kept trying to put out leaves whenever the temperatures would come up even the least bit. You would see it producing leaves, and then they would just die back. You can see that some of them were eat, definitely frost, uh, been bitten by frost here. Here's a close up of uh, some of this vetch that we're growing. Really great cover crop. Uh, so, you know, it's related to peas. The vining, we didn't have anything for it to really vine up and over, uh, but it does well on its own, just scrawling around. Here's a close-up again. 
you know, leave your, if it's not a diseased plant when it dies, like these sunflowers, there's no reason why you shouldn't leave them standing. Uh, we'll get to that. You'll even see some pictures uh, and examples of why you want to leave them standing. But they're going to be wonderful places for insects to overwinter, and they're a good source of bulky organic material that's going to require a healthy soil life in order to break down. So you're feeding, you want to feed your soil with not just mulch, but the bulky remnants of your previous crops as well. Uh, here we have some of the goldfish still swimming around. It doesn't get so cold here, so this upper pond really isn't that deep. Um, but we managed, we had to watch it and make sure enough water stayed in there uh, so that they wouldn't freeze. But as I said, we had a really mild winter, so we didn't have to give them all that much. And I left the water hyacinth in. As you can see, it's warm enough for algal growth. So that was a, the food source. We've never fed these goldfish unless we're throwing insects or you know, pretty much <laughs> insects in there. Every once in a while we'll throw them. Uh, and I don't even stay, stick around to see if they eat them. I just kind of assume that as I walk away they might hear a little pop and they'll eat them. This is in the old uh, nightshade guild. All the way at the top of the screen is the second swell. I know it's really hard to see. The lighting in winter is uh, sort of difficult for me as a new photographer, so this really is, uh, picture is sort of unclear. But again, you can see that we've got a red clover uh, crop going in. There's chickweed. Yarrow is still growing, amongst some others. Um, everything was covered either in mulch or in a cover crop. Here again, old another part of that same guild uh, it's a dacon radish here in the middle oregano on the top top center there's some oregano that's still growing we have uh, different types of dead nettles and uh, henbit that's growing just you know the birds bring it in again this is pretty much the same spot here and you can see it's not huge you know none of these plants are all that large uh, but they're not being covered up. I've got some stones next to some of them to see if that would help retain some heat. Uh, the white stones don't do as good of a job as black stones, of course. But I think they they work. And even if they don't do anything for heat, of course, they're going to be uh, a place that you're going to, if you turn them over, you're going to find earthworms and other types of critters. So it's good to have them in your garden. Um, it's good to notice how short everything is now because by the time we get to spring, um, and I don't, you know, probably won't be amazed, but I was very, very pleased with how well these cover crops responded to the onset of spring. Here's a close-up of a daikon radish. Our daikon radishes didn't grow as large as they sort of were supposed to. Um, attribute that to the fact that we've got a clay soil. It's still, you know, this is only the beginning of the second year of a garden, so the structure isn't quite there yet. Um, so, again, we weren't growing these for food, we were growing them to help break up the soil. And even though they didn't grow large enough to break up the soil, you leave them in there and they flowered later on in the spring. And so next year we should have self-sown, or actually this fall, you know, we should be seeing some self-sown daikon radishes coming up throughout the garden. And that's really the purpose here is to spread the plants through, let them seed, and then so then in the next year while we're still cover cropping, we're just going to have more and more of these plants coming up on their own. Here's an old uh, spotted mint. This is that spotted mint flower. Uh, again, you just let them stay dry. Uh, they're overwintering sites and they provide a little bit of interest uh, visually throughout the winter. This is a little raised bed that we built when I dug out the first swale. I actually wanted the first swale to be a little bit deeper so I uh, dug it out and made a little raised bed and I didn't plant anything there I just put the compost we did plant some garlic and things but most of this are these are native plants or not native plants uh, I don't think all of these I think chickweed is from uh, Europe but of course it's it, they're naturalized now so just wanted to see what would grow if you left it alone and uh, you know chickweed is a dynamic accumulator so why not and it's edible you, know, you cook it down, it's not the best raw, I don't think, but if you cook it down, it's pretty good. 
And here, and this is a great example of what I'm talking about by allowing your plants to self-seed. Look at all these lettuce plants. You know, we I put some seed out, but most of this is from the plants from last spring. And they just come up on their own, grow at their own pace, and they don't compete as well with the white clover, of course. You know, they're not fixing their own nitrogen. Uh, but white clover, you know, we just, you just cut it back. Um, you know, no, most plants aren't going to grow faster than you can swing a blade, as Jeff Lawton says. So uh, here's another view of the green, old green gill. It's pretty much still a green gill. We didn't really plant too much in it. Uh, but I did, you know, put out these uh, bamboo and twine borders around the, the beds because the white clover, well, it takes over everything, and you can't really tell where you double dug and not, and so avoid compaction and keeping the paths. And we've got a whole lot more moisture in the garden now and uh, so much more food. So here come, uh, you know, slugs. And we've got slugs. This is an oyster shell. I would just throw the oyster shells, if we ever eat any, out into the garden. Um, eventually, they may break down as they get covered with, um, with organic matter and the fungal networks get to work on them. I mean, I'm not saying in the next couple of years, but I would, I would imagine that in 10 years, if you went out, you might find that these have been eaten away a little bit if they get covered up. Uh, but uh, you can see this guy was, hi I flipped this over so he was hiding underneath it. Here's some yarrow still trying to grow and send out new shoots throughout the winter. Uh, this is taken from right by the willow oak and we're looking east. Um, Roman chamomile and German chamomile around the base of the oak. And around the oak, we look at all these uh, branches. We put a lot of branches. They're not really high and not too thick, but they do disturb the wind patterns a little bit. Um, you know, nothing like a real evergreen uh, windbreak, but, you know, it's, it's, again, it's experimentation, it's habitat, so you let it go. But look how green everything is. That's the purpose here. Keep things green, keep these growing. You know, zoomed out a bit, everything, all the deciduous trees, of course, you know, they're not doing anything right now, but look at how much space becomes available to growing organic matter and mulch and, you know, nutrient accumulation over the winter in this, uh, in this climate zone. There's no reason why we shouldn't be taking advantage of this instead of just lie, letting it lie dormant with mulch. You should grow something. Uh, the pond is really low. And you can see there's not too much water down in there. Uh, next picture. Here's some of the mounds that are outside of that temporary fence. And I haven't done anything with those. I haven't seen uh, any real reason to do too much with them. Mostly because, well, the dogs run all over them and uh, do their thing. And we're concentrated on the areas that we've double dug and that are protected. But in the coming years, I think we'll see... Uh, just spreading seed that's shade tolerant throughout there, but they do have some really great south facing and southwest facing aspects that I really want to take advantage of. Um, but right now, it's it's just not feasible. Again, old nightshade guild. Um, hard to see the paths here. I I didn't really feel like putting the money down on buying pine straw this year. The pine straw really makes the pathways pop and it really uh, helps visually, but why why spend the money if it's not completely necessary? Uh, this is again red clover and alfalfa. Uh, there's a few plants in here. If you see these, if it, on, the, on the right hand side of the screen, top center, there's a dark brown uh, you know, just frost-bitten plant. That's a lemon balm, and lemon balm is actually growing underneath there and a few other locations throughout the winter. So most of it dies back, uh, but it stays green throughout the winter in our climate. Okay, that was January 10th. So let's go to the 11th. And these are some more wider angle shots. Uh, we've just had a rain, so the swales are filled. Uh, you can see how nicely we've tucked in the maple with um, those branches that uh, so that bird's nest thing I was talking about. You can see on the left hand side of the screen some of the branches that we've put up as a sort of a windbreak. Um, 
Winter, of course, is when we get a lot of rain, and it's nice that we have something growing that can utilize it. Uh, grain Guild. Here's the second swell. It hasn't been completely filled up. I mean, you actually can't even hardly see there's any water in there. Um, let me zoom in and take a closer look. No, I don't think so. Uh, we put in, you, you can see these the gray things. Those are egg cartons. So we just put those in instead of giving them the recycle with their paper. So we put them into the swales and let them break down on their own. A little bit wider, including more of the garden. Um, I was really, really happy with how things were going over the winter. I would have liked it to be colder and had more snow, uh, but yeah, it, well, we took advantage of what we had and uh, kept things kept things moving. Here's a comparison shot: how green our garden is versus the brown and semi-green. It, it doesn't look good. The other lawn doesn't look good. Uh, I find what we're doing a lot more interesting. Uh, than a conventional lawn, even in the winter time. And as you can see, with a lot of the brown, there's a lot of decay going on, and that's that's the period of time in the temperate zone, of course, when we have a lot of decay. Let's move on to the 25th. So a couple weeks later, this is a long shot of the garden. Can't really see too much, but you can see that things are things are growing, things are happening. Even at the bottom center of the screen, that's a comfrey plant. Uh, even in the shade, it only gets a few hours of sun during the winter time, and it's still putting out leaves over the winter. Uh, you can see it a little bit closer here. There's two of them, and uh, the parsley, which is almost dead center, that parsley plant's doing really well over the winter. And we have a lot of dandelions. Dandelions, of course, being one of the best dynamic accumulators, as well as one of the earliest flowering plants. So we have a lot of those growing. Uh, here's a picture of the red maple. Remember how this red maple had a terrible fungal infection the first winter. Uh, it's pretty much pass, patched itself up with all the nutrients that it was able to acquire from the mulch and the organic uh, fertilizer that we did when we double dug. And the, I mean, it's just, when you get this spring, uh, I'll have to dig up some of the older pictures that show um, what the trees look like in spring. I know we had a much warmer winter this year, so they they went to leaf earlier, but we've never seen the trees respond to anything we've done as well as um, these permaculture techniques. Here's by one of the birch trees, obviously. It's, like I said, it's bedded down, and we also had a, a patch of uh, one of the beds that didn't really have too much growing in it, just too much shade. And so it was almost bare dirt, so I just covered it in a thick layer of uh, pear leaves. And this showing just how every everything is growing really well, providing overwintering sites, a diversity of places. I would really like to have some woody shrubs, but we're preparing the ground for those right now. But the woody shrubs are going to be excellent sites for birds and for insects and everything else to spend the winter. But we'll get to adding more layers uh, in the garden. And it's it, again, it's really fun to go through these pictures and see just what's going on. Um, our dog, one of our dogs, Zoe, absolutely loved. <laughs> she wanted to come out here and take pictures with me. Uh, again, an old part of the night, not Nightshade Guild, but Four Sisters. Look at all the cabbages growing with some clover in between them. Uh, we could have packed more plants in, I think. We could have pack, packed more plants, but at least you don't see any clay. I mean, there's there's no clay visible. The only clay you're going to see is, like down here, with the pond. Uh, pond's filled up a little bit more, and things are moving along. Another view, I like this shot. Um, you know, lumpy, it's not lumpy as it would be if we had shrubs, or evergreen shrubs, but... It's not just a uniform grass level. There's there's some diversity, structural diversity going on there. And underneath these pine trees where I've put these pear leaves, um, I was really, really surprised that in, this is the berm, and the berm is compacted soil. That's why we're doing the raised beds on the berm instead of trying to hack it up. Uh, at the end of spring, I moved back because I had some plants I wanted to put in here. And I moved some of this, some of these leaves back, and you could go down two or three inches fairly easily. Uh, we we hadn't done anything. Those are just the bre the breakdown, the additional organic matter 
um, and the action of earthworms and other types of uh, microorganisms that are loosening the soil once they have some kind of cover. I mean, grass grass is okay, but mulch is going to be a whole lot better with a decomp active decomposition. Here's again, this is like I said, this is one of my favorite um, vantage points of the garden. You can really see everything all the way up to the green guild on the top left, stretching out beyond the fence, um, the temporary fence into the rest of the yard on the right. And you can see the nice gentle slope that we work with. And you can see a lot of the standing material too. There's a lot of material still standing up. Uh, this, again, this really shows the nice, um, almost like a wattle fence around this oak tree that we have. Another picture. We're just going to keep going through these, pause a couple seconds, uh, let you take a look. Um, again, it's nothing spectacular, but we were happy with it. Really happy. I mean, we, once, once winter came and uh, it does this nice, the seasonal dieback and you can rest for a while. You have this nice period of rest and we're gently working the soil through the winter with these plants. And you can really feel that now things are at a really nice pace. Um, the pace has slowed down enough that we can reflect upon what we've done. And we have a moment to just take it all in, uh, how much work we've managed to do. Um, it's really nice. And the light sometimes in the winter can be really nice. Here you can see around the ornamental plum that's on the left, just this really nasty kind of patchwork. Uh, but course when I come back we had stopped mowing it and scalping it so it's already come back we have like Bermuda grass and crab grass which is of course all this brown it's really nasty brown uh, not our favorite not our favorite but we're working on replacing it just another picture um, where the water exits on the left side where those logs are not really logs it's sticks it's branches that's where the water exits out and again, the nice, gentle, very gentle slope of the property. And also take note of how much shade there is. Um, I think I'll have some better pictures of it coming up soon. Here, here, that looks I knew they were coming up. Uh, look at how far the shade of the house encroaches upon the garden over the winter. And so even with this amount of shade every day, um, Every day, the thing's probably maybe like 2 o'clock in the afternoon or something like that. Um, most of the garden's in shade. Most of what we've double dug, but it's still green. And thing, that's another reason why nothing's so large is because of the amount of shade. Um, but uh, if it goes even, I mean, the house, two-story house on a slope, something to think about. This is one reason why we wouldn't want to plant too many early flowering uh fruit shrubs or anything because that transition from sun to shade, that immediate harsh shade and harsh light change can force them to drop buds. So we'll have to experiment with what type of plants we want to put in there. I mean, in this, you know, if this is taken from upstairs, this plainly shows how much shade we're getting. But at the same time, look at the berm, which is uh, running along the back fence. Look at how much that that's going to get full sun throughout the winter. And even the raised mini hugel culture beds that I built underneath the pine trees, in the winter time, those receive sun. Uh, and so hopefully, once those get going, because that they're built with soil from the ponds that is a subsoil, so they're inherently low in organic matter. They're just not the best growing mediums right now. So we have a bit of work to do to get those up to speed. But in the winter time, we should be able to grow. A lot of our lettuces and everything else probably without even the use of any kind of cover uh, this is another picture from upstairs I mean look at how much is is growing in the old nightshade guild and you can see the paths kind of well from up here it's a lot easier to see that but look at again look at the, the difference between our lot and the neighbors um, you can tell regeneration is happening here and not over there um, Okay, I'm going to pause this for a minute here and see if we've gone over 30 minutes yet. Oh, now I've got about five, six minutes left, so let's see how far we can get into February. This is February 6th. 
Green Gill. We've been getting a lot of rain, which is nice. In the winter time, it's going to store. We can't store too much water yet in our soil. It doesn't have that much organic matter. But with the living plants, they're going to store a lot of water by themselves. Uh, so the nice thing to know is that we're accumulating biomass, and in the coming winters, more water is going to be held by the fungal networks, by the roots, and uh, by just the decaying organic matter that's in the soil. Uh, so we can hopefully store enough water that will get us through some of the early parts of summer where we don't have a lot of rain. Uh, the summertime is very intermittent, almost drought-like conditions very often. But swales are full here. We're growing winter crops. Uh, so things are good in the garden. Another view. Look at all the bamboo that I have to work with. Not as much as uh, I would want, but we can reuse our bamboo. It doesn't decompose that quickly. So I, I use it for a, a lot of things, as you can see, like laying out pathways and making sure we can see them through thick uh, cover crops. Willow tree, which is center left. It's hard to really see it. It blends in with the fence. But the willow tree is, uh, you know, the supports are gone. We've got some white clover and uh, daikon radishes that are growing underneath it right now over the winter time. Uh, it's really nice. I like this area of the garden. I'm not sure exactly why. I think it's just because anytime you garden, you end up liking all of it. Uh, here's, a, here's a neat picture looking looking south up the slope from the where the okra used to grow. Uh, this sort of lighter brown shrubby looking thing on the right side is that old cosmos plant and around it these tall tall plants are the uh, the remnants of the okra. And the okra was fun to watch decompose. I've got some pictures of it getting eaten away at the base. We left all the basil plants and everything standing so you can see those. Uh, here's what, you know, like sort of the bog area between the two ponds. But once these ponds are sealed, you know, it'll be more boggy than it is now. But it was a great spot for the horsetails. And you'll see the growth of the horsetails in the spring uh, was just phenomenal. And how we couldn't get them to grow where they were before I had transplanted them. But, boy, they, they definitely took off when you put them in the appropriate niche. Um top right with that pine tree, so you're using branches to hold the leaf mulch in, sort of on contour. I've already laid out where I want a new bed to be on that berm. Uh, there's some large logs, center, top center, it's going around and outlying a large area that I want to turn into a, a sheet mulch part of the garden. We're already starting to see flowers in the cabbage. Uh, these cabbages that are on the bottom here are already flowering February 6th. That's how warm it is. I mean, they're and they're they're getting mature because I planted them pretty pretty late. Um here's here's a here's a good picture of how much dirt I had to move. Uh everything where it's flattened at the bottom left was a massive mound of dirt that I had to use in order to um increase the size of these Ra these raised beds were supposed to be this big and maybe even a little bit bigger and I've since laid down some uh, some grass that I cut from behind the fence there was some dried out grass and I put those on the southern facing parts to try to keep it from drying out too much and those are really a big work in progress I've actually done a little bit of uh, damming here in the bottom center it's hard to see um, but there's a little dam there that's going to collect water and uh, you know hold it between one of these mounds and the tree. Uh, just trying to put in like mini earthworks. Anything you can do to slow down water is a good idea. Here, zooming out a bit, you can see just how much bigger they've gotten since I've managed to finally get all this dirt out. Just another view. And we have some frogs moving in already in February. This is they they like the upper pond, I guess, because they don't like hanging out with the fish too much. So since we don't have many aquatic plants, I guess they don't like hanging out around where all the fish are. Here's some of the cabbages that are flowering close up, and here's the frog again. I really like we love the frogs. The frogs are great. 
Um, you know you're doing it, something right when the frogs arrive and they want to stick around even in the winter time. And they're active in the winter. And here's a close-up of a great blue lobelia that is also growing throughout the winter. All right, so that's uh, January through the first week of February 2012. And we'll keep on going. Uh, hopefully I'll speed up with the narration, but we'll find out uh, as we keep going. Thanks for listening.